now it's on. Okay, so this is. How do you, how do you pronounce your name? Rudiger Trojok. Rudiger Trojok. Okay. And uh, how old are you this year? 30. 30. Okay. You? And I'm 33. Yeah. Not too far away. I know you decided to travel here for how many years? A couple of years. It's quite an unsteady lifestyle, eh? Yeah, just traveling around. Um, at some point, I do want to kind of have a stable place so that maybe I can build a lab as well. And that's what I'm trying here. I haven't succeeded very much yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first question How and when did you get interested in biology? Ooh, I think I was like six years old or so. What happened then? Mm, I think my oh well I, maybe that's more natural science I think. My dad told me about atoms. I was fascinated with atoms and molecules. I tried to see them, but it didn't really succeed. And um, how did you try to see them? Just looking at them, but it didn't really work. It's just more to see. Them. <laughs> and uh, so that that fascination kept me going to look into stuff. And. Uh, did a microscopy course when I was I don't know, eight or so in the school, and yeah, learning about unicellular organisms. And, yeah, so I was always drawn into the micro, the micro world and the nano world from early on. Yeah. And then, uh, at, I think I was sixteen. I changed my school, my high school, and went into a high school that specialized in biotechnology. They taught us how to do genetic engineering there, and, and I always, already then had the idea that I wanted to do this on my own. But uh, the technology wasn't available. I mean, not for me at least. And, uh, everything was bulky and expensive and out of reach. And then I started studying biology when I was twenty, and I studied for almost seven years. And um, in the studies, I started to build my own laboratory and do my own projects. And also in parallel to the university in the end. And I'm kind of still doing that. I'm you know, 30 and still having. Now I have my lab, I can do the things that I was dreaming of when I was a teenager. Um, yeah, and now I'm trying to professionalize it more and more. So. That's, that's the track. Let's see. So far, I'm surviving with it. Don't know where it's going. Oh, okay. So it's been a 15 year journey, more or less. Well, yeah, well, since since the first ideas of doing this independently, uh, kind of, you could say that. I mean, bio, do you say bio, biohacking started? six, seven years ago, but actually in the first semester when I was 20, I already bought my first laboratory equipment over eBay and uh, tried to build the lab, but I didn't have the knowledge to use it. So that was just having the box of stuff that I was collecting for some time. But seven years ago, all those things really started to agglomerate and I guess uh, yeah, mainly the internet connecting people like me all around the world. Bureaucracy and um, so also, you first connected with them on the internet. Yeah. Um, through which platforms? Uh, Google Groups. And this was seven years ago. I think in two thousand eight or nine. Yeah, seven eight years ago, or maybe. A I think I was looking into it 2008 when they just started up, um, but I was not really understanding or like seeing the, seeing what's happening. And then I got decided to get more involved uh, shortly after. At, at that time, were you the only one doing this? In where were you at the time? Was in Freiburg, studying at the university, it's a small town. So at the yeah, time, I, was the, I was the only one, just at home. 
wasn't there anyone around you who was remotely interested? I tried to get some of my student colleagues uh, into it, but they were mostly laughing at me and saying, like, why do you want to build a lab if you have one in the university and why do you want to be obsessed with these kind of things when you have it all day long? And you, know, you go home and you continue it, and, you, know, like, you work eight hours in the lab in the uni and then you go home and you have your crappy lab, which is like, so much worse than what you've got in the uni. You have to put your own money in, your product time, and no one really understood it. I don't know. Seems like a challenge to do, so I did. Um, now? Is, is it different now? Not so much. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there's more people getting involved, but it's still kind of a nerdy thing. Mm. And the lab is still at home, it's a bit more outgrown and more functional. Um, actually, the law changed recently in Germany um, about half a year ago. They unlocked GFP, so now I'm allowed to clone GFP at all. It's quite an advancement, yeah. because everything was super forbidden. So also many people thought that's just criminal to do, which it never fully was, but it was very difficult to do it legally right. It still is, it's still borderline stuff, I mean, like frontline or borderline stuff. Yeah, just today I talked to authorities about it, what I can do and what I cannot do. So what did they say? Well, they already know me. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, yeah, really good, good, yeah. <laughs> well, what are you going to do this time? Okay. <laughs> you, you are working for the uh, government, right? So some sort of Not the government, I was working for the parliament. So as a advisor for the parliament, for the German parliament, on synthetic biology. So this is the report. <laughs> <coughs> you can download it for free in the web. Right. It's all in German, so it's not much help for you. It is a thick book. Yeah. There's 70 pages of this are for me. Right. It's about biohacking, which is a bio. So, it's so this is about synthetic bio, genetic engineering in general. Available in English online as well? Yes. Just in German. Just in German. Um, so from 90, 191 to 254, that's it's all about biohacking and exactly these questions that you're asking me, but all in German. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about the, the early pioneers in the 90s that I found in the arts, like Eduardo Kark and this kind of people. And um, so they were conceptually doing that in the 90s, but not really doing it, I just mock up ideas and fictional concepts. And then there was, I divided this in uh, chronologically. And the next step is the phase two, we call it. The phase one was early 90s or until 2000. And then no, actually it starts, um, like the phase two starts with 2008. So that was the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, in 2008, there is uh, the do yourself bio scene popping up globally. Um, and it's mostly connected to the internet. So that was like the catalyzer for the whole thing. And then there's a lot of questions coming up to freedom of science. Who's a scientist? Who's not a scientist? Who's supposed to do what and not, not supposed to do other things? And, and about institutionalized science and non-institutionalized science. That were, the, were the questions that came up with this appearance of, of the do-it-yourself bio people. And then um, like in that, around that 2000, 10 times all the hackerspaces popped up. I think also Singaporean popped up around that time. And then more technology came in and media um, made it big and biosecurity questions came up. Um, mostly exaggerated the whole thing. And some people were doing microscopes and then everyone's talking about Ebola and killer viruses and stuff. It's quite off. And the media was in some parts really hype and sometimes really horror and really not reasonable. And then the next uh, stage, phase four, is uh, about startups and professionalization out, like stemming out from that um, scene, the networks. And on the other hand, um, the challenges for open source and non-profit, um, like 
basic research or community projects like social work and so on, science education and that are also coming out from that. Um, this is focused on Germany or on Europe? No, that's a global, it's a global the description of the global scene, but of course, I mean, like what I encountered is mostly prominent there. And then uh, I have a bit of speculation about the future, security and safety, um, legal questions, possible applications, and then what society could do with it right now, and what's the, the roles and the questions for near and long term future. It's called Synthetische Biologie, die nächste Stufe der Bio- und Gentechnologie. Vom Büro für Technikfolgenabschätzung beim Deutschen Bundestag. It's just uh, Google TAB Symbio. Then um, you can try to top Symbio. And uh, what have you worked on at home with your DIY bio projects? A lot of things actually. Hmm. Perhaps some highlights. Microbiology and synthetic biology. Um, although I'm trained as a cell biologist, I never did that because it's too complex and too tedious and too difficult. Um, a bit of basic research here with the Landauer um, entropy generation of cells. Um, a lot of arts projects or mostly collaborating with artists. And partially I was also becoming an artist and getting invited to galleries and exhibiting my stuff. Although it was originally not intended to be artwork, but it turned out that the artists perceived it as art and then I became an artist this way. How did that happen? I was making an exhibition in Denmark for the Copenhagen Medical Museum, Medical History Museum, Museum and um, they invited Malte uh, Borg working with me back then in Hacker Space in Copenhagen. And uh, they wanted to have a biohacker lab in their museum. So I don't know, kind of finding it interesting. And um, yeah, we built that space and then I thought that I want to communicate something about genetic engineering in that space and um, I built the gene gun as a conceptual piece of I try to make it functional. And the gene gun is a tool with which Monsanto gained most of their patents in the early 90s on crops. So they engineered crops and then they brought the patent law into the domain of genetic engineering. Because they come from this engineering patenting background and they're a super aggressive and terrible company. And um, so actually they brought all this culture of dominance and um, kind of imperialistic attitude into it. And um, stirring up all the fights with the environmentalists. And then I thought, okay, this, this tool that made them so powerful, a gene gun, is itself kind of like a, a weapon, or has a name of a weapon at least. And um, I, I built that, um, made for, from trash that I found in the hex space, and exhibited this in, uh, in the museum. And then the Ars Electronica, which is this quite profiled avant-garde, new media, new technology, arts venue, contacted me because I saw a picture of it and they wanted to have it. That's, that made me an artist. <laughs> it's, it's quite iconic, the Jean Gun you made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I was... I was actually just walking around in the forest and uh, seeing this stick that looked like a gun and I had this association of I want to make this into into the gene gun and then I cut it out from the forest and worked on it and put on all the scrap electronics I found in the hacker space trash. And you built this in Copenhagen? Yeah, and, and love it out. Okay. And it works? Uh, this one um, did work at low pressure. You could program it with an Arduino and then shoot gusts of air, but only at 15 bars or so. 
and I learned that it's not strong enough and I ramped it up to 50 bars and the whole thing exploded. And <laughs> actually what did work then was a whip dispenser. So I had an appointment with the journalist um, to show off the gene gun and the functionality and um, I was a bit worried about if it's strong enough and so on, it was not broken at that moment. And um, I had it so far attached to a vacuum compressor from a fridge that was giving it the pressure. And um, then to make it mobile, I wanted to connect it to the CO2 cartridges that you can blow up your um, wheels for the bike. If you have a flat tire, you can just have the CO2 cartridges. And they have 60 bars or so, like the pressure of them is quite high, so I wanted to use those. I was a bit worried if it's working or not, and I was at my mom's home in the kitchen, and she had this whip dispenser there on the table, and then I realized that this is actually what I need, because it has the laughing gas cartridge, it's 40-something bars pressure, and um, you release the small cartridge pressure into the bigger volume of the bottle of the whip dispenser, and then you can press the trigger and release that from there, and um, by adjusting the volume of the bottle you can you know, control the pressure, and um, so I, I borrowed that from my mom and uh, went to the demonstration in the university with the journalist, borrowed some um, plasmids, some, some CFP something for plants, plasmid, and I loaded on the gene gun, the wooden one I made, and it just exploded in my hands and didn't work. And then I used the, the whip dispenser instead, and that did the job. It actually transformed the onion cells in uh, with the... What dispenser is that? Hmm? What dispenser? A whip dispenser. Whip dispenser. Oh, this thing. And this worked better. Yeah, you put the, the cartridge here with the laughing gas in, gets the pressure in here, you can release it. Oh. Shoot. Okay. Simple. <laughs> <laughs> so do you still have the remains of the gene gun? Yeah, this is this is the actual gene gun that did the job with the dispenser. It's, it's like a product from the 50s or something. I don't know what it's like. Oh, it's for cream. Yeah, in the cream. Bit. That's very funny. So you don't need uh, a patent on gene guns. You can become you can become a do-it-yourself Monsanto with a whip dispenser. Wow, look at that. Cream charges. What? What is a cream charge? It just stirs the the, the the milk or the cream. So you don't need a gene gun then? No, you don't need a gene gun, you just need a dispenser. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, okay, that's a good hack. Okay. Actually, people copied it. There was a, a girl from Switzerland, an 18 year old, who wanted to copy it. I don't know what came out of it. There was an artist in America copying it. Um, actually, two artists trying to copy it. Um, and there was a, that's the best one, a biotechnology student from some Indian university who successfully copied it and it refers to me as Rudiger Krojo, I'm terribly pronouncing my name, there's a YouTube video of him explaining it and the white coat and showing off his invention and crediting me, so it's really nice. Uh, and uh, you get some, almost a couple of thousand clicks now on it. <laughs> How did the journalist react when it exploded your gene gun? Actually, it was a, this was a nice report. It was a nice report. Uh, okay. okay. It, didn't, it didn't make much of a big bang or something. It was just like breaking apart. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, so that was... So the gene gun was your first... How do I put it? Your entry into the art world. Yep. And the first publicly 
make very public, successful, genuine work that I did. I mean, I had public um, appearances before and mentioned in, uh, in some other texts of journalists that were investig investigating on Bionic. That was also weird. I mean, the first thing after I connected with people online in 2009 ish is that uh, journalist pops up. So I meet one other biohacker in Germany and then the German journalist reporting about biohacking, although there were just two other biohackers besides him. And he made a TV show of it and a book and everything. He really exploited that subject a lot and made it really big, totally overblown. I mean, conceptually and theoretically it has a lot, lot to offer. Um, so that's what he was using, but practically happening was not very much at that moment. Um, so the media was kind of also pushing the whole thing themselves. So I, I wouldn't say that it's just a media thing, but the media played play the, their own role in growing it or making it the thing it is. Although. To be honest, the media attention doesn't really help. I mean, it brought a lot of like people that witness stuff, but not many active people. So all the people that actually do things that I've met along the way, I would probably would have met them anyway. So the media is just the media made a big stir in in the security community and in the politics. What happened? Well, the security community was bring up all their nightmares about bioterrorism, but now with the biohackers you can build tools that you can eventually weaponize whatever things that you find and I mean, all this kind of no-brainers because I mean, if you want to weaponize something, you can weaponize something. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you want to stab someone, you need a kitchen knife. So. When was this run? That was around, it happened mostly in the US, in this post 9 11 paranoia thing. I mean, they put a lot of money on this security community. Is this related to the uh, June 2012 FBI DIY bio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's an that's, uh, encounter actually. They did that before, I think they. I actually saw the FBI the first time in 2009 at the IGEM Congress in the MIT. They had to stand there and giving away T-shirts yeah, to the students. Yeah, and yeah. no one understood what they're doing there. Yeah. It's like, oh, the FBI is here. Oh, well, they give T-shirts away. Okay. <laughs> so they didn't get involved in any of the projects. It like, yeah. made no sense to anyone why they are there, and they had no clue themselves. And um, I think they just have too much money. They want to be present everywhere, okay. policing everything, each and everything. It's a bit strange. And so they got involved more and more in the bike community because it got a lot of media attention and it steers the fantasy of people. You, know, you, you get, wow, you can be, you can make Frankenstein, you can make this or that, you know. Mm -hmm. and this is what they are working with because they are, I mean, their, their business is the fear of people. So if the people have dreams about something, they also have fears about something, and that's what they're exploiting. So they can make a big fuss around something that might be a danger or looks dangerous or sounds dangerous and uh, then they can sell their services to the politicians and they were using this a lot um, um, you were at, the, at this FBI DIY bio outreach workshop um, the BBC has written about it a few people have written about this Yeah, there was Sasha Karberg writing for the BBC, actually, he was the same journalist that made the fuss here in Germany. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I would like to find out from you, um, what, what was this event like from your point of view? Well, I, I brought Sasha Karberg there myself, mm -hmm. because I didn't want to go to a weird security conference by the FBI, but I had no clue what this is about. So I wanted to, actually, I brought the media, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, what I described now is true, but I also can use the media a bit for my own purposes and in this case it was kind of being known in the public also protects you to some extent and I had no clue what, what I'm dealing with so I rather prefer that people know what's happening than they don't know what's happening and also if you bring the security people 
that are maybe not always the nicest into the light of the public. They they cannot do their you know they cannot do their dirty laundry in the shadows. I don't know if you understand what I mean. But of course they always have they also have some points. I mean there's in this report here there's big chapters about security and safety. Um, so yeah it's it's always a negotiation of what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Um, and they, by focusing on the subject of biosecurity, the FBI at least reached that people think about it. I don't, mostly don't agree with the way they are approaching the subject because they are sending policemen that were working on border patrol to Mexico searching for like mafia drug dealers, they sent those people to universities now to deal with students from abroad and other cultures and so on. And I don't think it's the best thing to do. Um, but at least they made the point that someone needs to take care of it. And um, it also made me think a lot about the legislation and um, trying to map out what's a good idea to do. I don't want to focus my personally on the dark side, as other people that have a lot of pleasure in doing that. But if you want to be an actor in the field yourself, then it's advisable to think about what's the positive impact of your work and what you can do right. Um, so that's what I spent a lot of time on the last years, also writing the report here. I have a question related to that, but before that, I'm um, still a bit curious about what happened with the outreach workshop. So, what was it like? Oh, it was quite depressing, a bit scary. Um, but they tried to make this friendly face and buddying up and exchanging business cards and so on. But uh, it was in this hotel where you couldn't open the windows, and uh, it's probably normal in the US, but for me, it was kind of like I felt locked in somehow. Um, and then the conference hall was in the basement. Um, there was these FBI ladies. They were nice, the kind of people, but standing in front of the doors and kind of like had to get in past them. You know, and then you were kind of felt to be a bit trapped in, in this. So there was one at every single one of your doors. No, but there was just one main door through which you enter the room, and then you had you kind of had all these security. Well, there were about 50% of the visitors there were from the security community. Also, American military was there, DTRA, which I found not, I mean, in Europe, we never have that, so I don't I didn't really appreciate that too much. Um, and they were sitting behind us, so observing us. And I was, I mean, you, you didn't make me feel very comfy. So, most of the time, did they say anything? Or was the well, they had their panel talks, and we had our panel talks. And then there was one situation where they were kind of yelling at us about this scenario where that actually Dan Grushkin made up from Genspace, a journalist. So these journalists, they always play these, <laughs> these, these weird roles. So he's, uh, he was working with the FBI before. And in the US, they don't have this. I mean, they are asked to be to collaborate more with the security environment because of the things that happened in the US attacks and so on. Um, but in Germany, this is usually, it's treated very differently here. So we, of course we have police, and not, not too little as well, and we have intelligence agencies and so forth. But through the historic experiences in Germany, the police is not allowed to get the information from the intelligence. Um, unless there is a legal, like, the, the court says you are allowed to do that. Um, and on the other hand, the intelligence is not able to do police work. So they have no executive powers, they just observe and inform. Um, so we, that's strictly separate. And then there's no, no involvement of police or intelligence community whatsoever in academic research and in arts or so. So that's, I mean, that's not, that's a no-go thing in Germany. We had that in the Nazi times, it went horribly wrong. We had that in the communist times in Eastern Germany, it went horribly wrong. So it's better to keep this kind of things apart. 
and they were mixing this all up and I don't think it's a good idea but that's more a cultural historic problem so um, yeah so we had to deal with those people and they came up with this scenario written by Dan Grushkin that there's a biohacker that is actually a terrorist and just disguising disguising as a as a science science interested interest lay person coming to your hacker space, abusing all your knowledge and builds uh, something that you don't know of and then disappears and then ten days later there's a terrorist attack and it's your fault that you didn't report her to the FBI. And this is uh, yeah. first of all it's a bit f it's a bit too far fetched for me and I don't know. I, I just don't like to think too much in this negative negativity concerns because if you my experience is that many people are actually doing that maybe they have reasons for doing it but if everyone thinks this way then your get your mind just circles around this paranoia the subjects and then you are omitting all the good things that are there as well that you just don't see them anymore um, and you don't look for other ways to handle it so I mean if, if you are teaching your kid, let's say you have a boy and six years old or something, you go to the forest and you teach him how to use a knife and chop a stick or something. You have to teach the kid how to hold the knife and to move it away from your own body and not to point at people with it, you know, this kind of stuff. So you inform a proper use of, of that technology and of that tool. That doesn't prevent other people from using it as a weapon, but it's the best thing that you can do. So that that's the way I'm kind of approaching the subject. Here. And has the FBI come back after that, after 2012? <coughs> Not officially, no. What is the European stand on this sort of thing? On DIY buying? Well, I am not aware of um, <coughs> of this. Uh, of the security community handling it, maybe they do, but I'm not aware of. I mean, if if I would be aware of, I think they would do the job not very good. So I mean, they probably have someone sitting there collecting reports for the archives, and whenever something needs something, they can pull it. But that's what they ought to do. Um, there was a lot of interest from. The political side and I was surprised to learn that it's in Germany mostly from the environmentalist perspective because it's their this it's actually their home turf you know it's environmental concerns by biology um, health and so on that's that's their subjects so it kind of makes sense but I didn't expect it that they reached out and invited me a couple of times to give lectures and so on uh, I communicate with them I still communicate with them from time to time um, and that was quite productive. I mean, we're not not fully aligned, but we have the same subjects of concern, so we just have different viewpoints and different angles on it. And there is a critical but constructive discussion around it. So that was interesting to, to get into. They actually inv even invited me to, to meetings and so on, and I could say my opinion, and we were picking it up. So this is still going on. That's still going on, man. Okay. Um, can we jump ahead a little bit? So in, in relation to uh, what, what you said just now about how the, the FBI event made you think about how to go ahead with your own activities, was, was it the reason why you started, uh, I guess, thinking about uh, safety guidelines, is it? Well, in part. I mean, we thought of this, of this before. We have this code of conduct that was mapped out by the participants in the European network itself with the facilitating help of the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, who also made the contact to the FBI, by the way. I'm still working with the Woodrow, with, I'm still working with the Woodrow Wilson Foundation now through my um, job in the um, University of Karlsruhe, part of this project called Syn Energy. We're doing this like stakeholder involvement of different players in the field, and um, um, so they are one of the stakeholders there. And um, I think even the FBI is coming at some of these events, but not. 
I'm not directly dealing with them. Um, then we have a lot of politicians. The Ethics Council of the German Parliament was uh, getting interesting, interested. Uh, one of the members is often visiting our debates. Um, yeah, so sorry, what was the question again? Um, so basically you, you drafted up guidelines for safe and responsible with your yeah. Yeah, well, we did that before, um, um, and I mean the, the awareness of the security community made me also more aware of the subjects. So I think that's the positive output of that work, that they raised awareness. Um, and the report here is concerned about that mostly, but I tried to find better answers than, those, than they were coming forward with that you don't need this paranoia to, to uh, go on because then you just end up in cases like Steve Kurtz and stuff like that, you know, and it's just not really productive. So I made suggestions how to govern this in a civil way, because I mean in Europe we are so much more ahead in governing this kind of technology than the Americans and the rest of the world. Since we use the pre precautionary principle that was laid out by Hans Jonas, a, a philosopher, Jewish philosopher that was a student of um, Heidegger. Actually, Heidegger lived just three houses away from where I lived in Freiburg. Um, but some, whatever, 60 years before me. Um, so Hans Jonas, after the Nazi crap, um, was mostly living in New York, and actually in Israel as far as I know. And he made up an ethics, uh, like he made up ethics for science and technology, mostly life science, and he used the ideas from Kant um, the, to uh, and the, the um, ethical imperative, you know that one? That you, I mean, it's, it's usually say that, that you shouldn't do to others what you don't want to happen to yourself. So this kind of imperative, it makes sense, I mean, if you don't hurt others, because you don't want to get hurt, then everyone's better off. Um, so he used that idea, but extended it, gave it a time dimension, and said that we should, we as humans, should not use our technology in a way that other our future generations um, will suffer. So, an ethics for for the use of technology. Um, and it's called the precautionary principle. Uh, I think he made this up in the 70s or so, and that was one of the founding or the guiding ideas for the Green Movement also, like for the environmentalists. And um, this went into the, the EU legislation, European, European Commission legislation on genetic engineering, mainly influenced by the German governance that have, came up in the 80s on the subject, that tried to adopt this these cautionary um, tales from, from the, philosoph for the uh, philosophers that analyzed uh, the ugly past of this country. And it says that you are, <coughs> it's a bit problematic though, <coughs> because you have to um, now um, assess the impacts of what you're doing before you actually do it. So you have to foretell, like enact precaution in, in your the way you're reducing technology, which is pretty much the opposite of the Amer of, of what the Americans are doing, who are shooting first and then look what happens, um, which makes it difficult to get the initiative and the like, like all the all the surprise effects that actually give you the freedom to act are taken away with this way. But they say that people assume that in the long run, if Everything has an effect, so every cause has an effect. And it falls back on your feet if you're thinking of a closed system. And in society in, in a country like Europe is quite quite close, quite dense. So whatever you do somehow fall, comes back to you eventually. And so now people tend to not do anything. Um, that's why we have this very strict legislation on GMO. And they're just very carefully now allowing us step by step a little bit more. Um, it's very conservative. While in the US you can throw GFP around you like you want to and here it's happy that after 
30 years of successful use of this technique, uh, you're first allowed to do something with it on your own. Not 20 years of GFP. Yeah, so we find we need to find ways to, to do that better, I think. Both the Americans and the Europeans. The Europeans are too paranoid, mm -hmm. but at least they take care, and the Americans they should take the right care, I think, in a more sophisticated way. And have, uh, have the DIY bio labs uh, <coughs> in Europe or around the world, have they taken up these guidelines? And, are the, and, and on, your, on your website as well, you mentioned peer lab inspections, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, was it your website or site online? I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway. Which, what just mentioned? Uh, peer lab ins inspections. Yeah, why oh. going around looking at yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that never got so far, no. Because it's not so institutionalized and it's not it's not properly funded, so people cannot do this. Um, and there's not so many people involved yet. But it would at least be a way to create kind of like a, a web of trust or something like that. Which is done by industry successfully in many cases. Um, yeah, but it never got that far, at least not now. And could you tell me more about the composition of the DIY bio scene in Germany? Or, or at least in Berlin? It's a bit underdeveloped. It's quite underdeveloped, the whole thing. There are some loners all over the country, but not too many. I think I know, I've been in touch with over the years, maybe with a dozen people or two dozen people that are doing things on their own mostly. I mean, many people are doing quite advanced stuff, but they are not considered as do just they don't consider themselves as do yourself biologists or biohackers. That was something that happened in the internet in a certain part of society that is affiliated with this technologies and that got hyped by the media. These people are not connected, so I, I bought, sometimes I buy machines on eBay, and then I find out it's just a private guy like me that has like a full outgoing lab in his house, like really professional, doing this for 20 years, but as uh, as a private man, there's a lot of these people out there, but they're not connected. Um, yeah, so the network is quite undeveloped, and that's I think also. The skepticism from from a cultural standpoint towards the subject and, uh, and the strict regulations that make it difficult. So we have a lot of designers and artists interested, but they are more kind of consumers of this knowledge and this technology than producers. And that's what's happening a lot in Berlin. A lot of artists uh, around here to be using these ideas. Artists using ideas from biology. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? After using biology? Well, I'm a bit honored in a way that I'm happy that someone sees the potential and picks it up. But sometimes I also feel a bit overwhelmed and I'm doing too much for them and they're asking for too much. Because they're not giving much back. I mean, they come up uh, with their ideas and then they want you to teach them and they want to get your knowledge and your technology and then they just leave and then they do their arts exhibitions, they get credits in their own domain, but they usually don't even cite you when you help them. Because it's about the artist, the genius inventor, you know, like the genius creator, creative mind, and they don't admit that they got help. So that's, and in academia, that's more my cultural background, it's very, and you need to get, you need to cite others, and if you don't do, you're really not nice. But for the arts, it's not well seen if you have to cite others because then it's not your original work and that's what they don't want, us, don't want. so that's uh, it's a bit of a culture clash there between the domains but I got a lot of nice inspiration from artists as well but don't bring me much glory but at least it's entertaining <laughs> so you've been in the art world for, for a while and I suppose it's quite different from the biology world that you were mainly in previously. So, 
after these few years in the Apple. What do you think of the Apple? What do you think about it? It's extremely difficult to um, to tell apart. I mean, there is no quality, like there's no absolute or qualitative measure of good or bad art. It's highly subjective and it's very mixed. I mean, if you go to Ars Electronica, you have really brilliant things next to really shitty things. And I don't know why the curators are putting it next to each other. Maybe they just don't know it better, or they have a totally different viewpoint than you, or it's very hard to tell. So some of the things I find quite ridiculous, some are really fantastic. Um, it gives you much more freedom to do what you are interested in than the science does, but even less stability. And science is already quite unstable in terms of job security and payment and so on. So arts is even worse. If you think of like materialistically what you get out of it, it's not so good. But yeah, in my late twenties I did that for some time now and it was enjoyable and maybe I think I, I think I would continue it as a hobby as a, as a side project thing. To be an artist. Mm. Okay. But I don't I don't have professional ambitions as an artist. In Berlin, are you? Uh, I think I heard you are trying to build a community lab for the bio. Mm -hmm. How is that going? Oh, it's a tough thing yeah, because the prices, the since the financial crisis, the rental prices went up like crazy. Uh, they they got five times as high as two thousand eight or so, like really crazy. But the wages are stagnating, and um, it's un almost unaffordable now to rent anything, especially if you want to do a community thing but there's not much money involved, you just don't get the space. You know, it's very, very hard. So for three years now we've been struggling with this and haven't really found a solution. Now we have two projects ongoing. I built a little laboratory in an abandoned or semi, like in a kind of a rundown industry building. But it's quite basic and it's not so usable at the moment and the landlord is not really moving it. It's not he promised some things that's not happening now and so it's kind of in the like in the limbo, I don't know. And the other thing is it's um promised but still dormant. So that's why I'm still stuck here with my dad at home. Yeah, it's a bit difficult. And there is no that's a that's a disappointing thing. There is culture funds and there is science funds. But if you do a crossover between culture and science, you don't get anything. Can't get from both. No, <laughs> you just oh. don't get anything because the, the artist people that are giving out the funds, they say, "Well, this is science. They, they've got lots of funding for their own work. They don't need to give them." And uh, the scientists actually just give money to institutes and professors, and not to individuals or nonprofits. And you don't, we don't publish because that's not the idea of what we're doing, or well, at least not the primary primary goal. And then it's not perceived as science as well. Although I think it is, it's just um, probably too avant-gardistic to be understood. Right. Is that why you're looking to try and, um, I guess, delve into business ideas using the MRI? Yeah, there's a number of, I mean, and I think in the Anglo-Saxon context, it's got the same problem because they don't even have that culture funds that we have. But they are a bit more flexible with doing the businesses, so that's that's where it gets more reputation and also some funding that you can make a living of. How's that part of it going for you? The living part? The business ideas. Oh well, it's it's in the starting slots. It's not it's not decided. I mean, we've got cool technology. We get. MIT calling, we get the Roche Diagnostics technology head calling us up for what we do. Um, so we are confident, I mean, the people I work with are quite confident that we've got something really cool that, uh, that intrigues people. Well, let's see how successful it will be because there's still some development that needs, needs to happen. Okay. I was, I was going to ask about uh, Well, I asked about what the 
seen here is like, and you can say it's 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 not very well developed. And I was thinking, I was, I was wondering about you know uh, backyard brains selling robo roaches. Mm -hmm. um, I think M there's a MIT supported a mino desktop coming out, and then you also what's the desktop? A mino desktop. A mino desktop. Yeah. That's from the Media Lab. This this box thingy with the flashlights and stuff on it. Uh, kind of like bento lab, but I guess more. Slightly more things. I'm not really certain. Did, it didn't look to me like you can do much more things. It, it, the, the thing I've seen is probably dysfunctional mock, mock up thing. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I I looked at it and it doesn't didn't make too much sense. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they brush it up now after they seen the. But I mean the, that's that's the American style, you know, just fake and pretend, and uh, then when you get enough people hooked, then uh, you can actually deliver something. That somehow resembles what you promised. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the MITs, I think they're actually stealing a lot of our ideas, the, especially the media lab people. I really think they are, they are really aware of what we're doing. They're following us online and so on. And uh, I mean, Urs came with his transportable lab first, then it was Bento Lab, and now the MIT Media Lab copies the same thing. I mean, what the fuck, I mean, that has been done five years ago by us. It's quite ridiculous. Aside from the copying, do you think that um, the fact of these things coming out, does it mean that DIY Bio would be hitting the mainstream anytime soon, or do you think it's, it's still a really difficult way to go? It's a good question. I don't really know. I mean, I wrote the book now that's tackling a similar audience on the same subject. Um, but um, I will see how well the book sells, and then I think I can tell more about this if it has a future or when not, or if not. Because I'm the first one that writes this kind of book in German language. And it has about 120, 30 million, well, 140 million German speakers in the world. So might be interested in that. So, if the sales go up, then I will know that's the right time to do something. If they don't, then it's probably too early or we'll never ever get there. So that's for me, it's a, it's a proof of like the, testing the waters with this, like how reliable this whole thing is. Um, it's going to depend on the publisher as well. Well, it's, it's not a bad publisher. They are, you know, the Conrad shops, electronics shops. They are everywhere where Conrad is as well. So, and they've been around since the seventies, so they know their business. I mean, there's, let's say there's around 10 people doing stuff, and then there's around Indolin, and then there's around like 20 artists and sign and other journalists and so on hovering around it, from time to time showing up and so on. What, what is the main, um, the, some of the more popular themes or projects or fields that DIY Bio and Berlin deals with? Like in Singapore, I think for us, a lot of it is fermentation, mm. you know, yogurt making, exchanging uh, microbes, I guess. How about over here? It's very technology driven. Uh, so we've got a lot of hardware you know, people building with Arduino sensors and um, fermenters and so on. So that's, that's, that's very, like actually the a lot of the developments in the WSF Bio community were around the hardware part. Because that's what needed to be updated, because 
the machines that are used by industry are just not very well suited. So there was a need for better hardware and we're still working on that actually. Maybe that's the, this generation of biohackers, if, bio, if you can consider biohacking as some new branch of activity, um, then I think this is a, like a, maybe can be considered as a mark for this time, for the last six, seven, eight years that it was focused, like concerned a lot around hardware. I think the bio times are still coming up. So if you look at the software that's out there, it's not very well developed either. Um, so there's still some... And my book is also aiming at programmers, so if they get programmers hooked on the subject, and if they start understanding what's needed, then they might come up with really better tools to, to design the biology, and if the hardware and the software are properly in place, then the biology can ramp up. But I guess it will take another 10 years or so until it's really, like, to a scale that it can be. But I, I believe it has an exponential future. The question is, will the biohackers be still involved then? Because people cannot do a hobby for 10 years in this to this extent. Um, or is someone else taking it on? Is it some companies? Is it some big new player? I don't know. Maybe universities are reforming a lot because they are very stuck at old school, the way they're doing science and communicating science. Maybe they learn from our experience and they do something new. That would be a possible way to go on. Yeah, let's see, it's <laughs> future is open. <laughs> okay. I think that we should just end it. Yeah. yeah. What's the time now? Um, 67. Thank you so much.